We're outside of Chase Bank in Lexington with the latest on a rough robbery where police say a man used a stun gun on a teller. It's official now. It'll be Matt Bevin versus Jack Conway for the governor's office in Kentucky. I affected a lot of lives that one day. A convicted killer apologizes in court. His attorney tells us what he believes caused his client to commit a string of crimes, killing an 82-year-old man. Tracking, alerting, protecting. This is WKYT News at 5. Good afternoon. A frightening situation. A bank teller recovering after being attacked during a robbery in Lexington today. The Chase Bank on Richmond Road near Patch and Drive was hit just before 10 this morning. Police say the robber jumped the counter and shocked the teller with a stun gun. Police have now released surveillance pictures of that suspect. WKYT's Kristen Kennedy has our top story at 5. Police are still trying to find the man responsible for robbing this Chase Bank. Lexington police first arrived at Chase Bank around 9.45 Friday morning to respond to a pretty violent robbery. They say a man walked into the bank and jumped over the gate that divides customers from employees. The side gate, you know, on the counter, he jumped over the gate on the side to get behind the counter. And at that time, he stunned one of the female tellers uh, before he got the money and then he fled. These are images captured on Chase Bank's surveillance video. Officers believe he's about 5'9 with a thin build. We have a male black with a gray jacket, green pants, a green backpack, uh, dreadlocks, wearing a hat, sunglasses, and uh, a mask covering his face. Our cameras caught a canine unit searching on the ground and a helicopter searching from the sky. We're told they lost track of them at the far end of the chop house, a nearby restaurant. The teller, police say, is recovering. She's fine, just obviously a little shaken up, but uh, no injuries or anything like that. When we talked with employees here at the Chase Bank, they told us that the teller is okay and that management gave her the day off. In Lexington, Kristen Kennedy, WKYT. Chase Bank leaders say they are working with police and giving all video of what happened to them. It's official. Republican Matt Bevin will take on Democratic nominee Jack Conway in the race for governor this November. Ten days after the primary election and a day after a re-canvas showed no change, James Comer conceded to Bevin this morning, losing by just 83 votes. Phil Pendleton was in Frankfurt when Bevin accepted the nomination, telling supporters it's time to unite. The Republican Party chair says they are unified, and the theme, We Are Kentucky, will guide them through the fall campaign as they run against Jack Conway and the Democrats. <laughs> Introduced by his running mate, Janine Hampton, Bevin was also joined by many of the state office seekers on the Republican ticket. James Comer conceded the race and is not asking for a recount, so the Bevin victory of just over 80 votes stands. He says he has the support of Kentucky's Republican establishment and U.S. Senators Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul, and he says the three who ran against him in the primary are now with him. They will be great assets, not only to our team, but to our entire ticket, to the state of Kentucky. Bevin pulled no punches in saying that voters will be able to tell a clear difference between him and Jack Conway and the Democrats. This is going to be a race about issues. What are the Democrats talking about? Nonsense. They're talking about gibberish. They're talking about things that have nothing whatsoever to do with taking Kentucky forward. And Conway released a statement today stating that he looks forward to a spirited race with Bevin through the fall as they both talk about the issues that are important to Kentucky families. In Frankfort, Phil Pendleton, WKYT. Bevin says issues surrounding education, tax structure, and the role and purpose of government will be critical in this race. Well, it has been another repeat outside today. Warm, humid, and scattered storms. And it may be the same thing again to start off our weekend. WKYT meteorologist Jim Caldwell is tracking it all for us in the First Alert Weather Center. You're right. More scattered showers and thunderstorms today. We go into your Saturday, and it looks about the same. Temperatures will look very similar as well. But Sunday might be a little bit different. Some change. 
widespread rain as opposed to scattered stuff. Let's see what's happening out there on some of our camps as we look across Kentucky. And you can see in some spots a little damp, like in uh, Frankfurt from a little earlier, a shower that passed through there. Roads still a little wet, but the sun trying to build back in off in the distance. Same thing here in Lexington. We were tracking a shower just about an hour ago. Off in the distance, now just blue skies mixing in with some clouds. Temperatures generally in the low and even some mid 80s showing up across parts of Kentucky. Showers and storms have been a little more active to our east, and that's where you're going to find the best concentration of them. It's not a non stop event, but we certainly are tracking some of those showers and storms out there. And a little more energy crossing over from Tennessee will likely lift through our area over the next few hours. Here's what our high resolution radar will show you. This takes us into the future. It's an hour by hour version of it. And notice by the time we get to around 9, 10 o'clock tonight, a lot of this rain will start to disappear as normal. The three day threat track will keep the chances of showers and storms around, though, into the weekend, both Saturday and Sunday. Maybe some of those could be on the stronger side. We will take a closer look at that. Coming up for you in just a little bit. He told the judge he was sorry he ruined so many lives. Today, a man convicted in a deadly carjacking in Lexington learned how long he'll stay in prison. A jury found Joel Searcy guilty last month. WKYT's Hillary Thornton was in the courtroom for today's sentencing hearing. At his sentencing today, both Joel Searcy and his attorney expressed remorse for his actions back in 2013. And they both say it was all the result of Searcy's life spiraling out of control. One of the things he would ask me over and over is, is when, when can I apologize? Lexington police say in August of 2013, Joel Searcy kidnapped a woman he knows and drove around aimlessly with her four children inside. His attorney calls this series of events that would follow an example of a good person being overtaken by drug addiction. He was under the influence of, of crystal meth. And after um, more than a day of believing people were chasing after him, he had just lost it. Investigators say while driving around recklessly, still with the woman and four children, Searcy was involved in a collision and left that scene. He began running down Broadway, begging every car he passed to please help him. And the terrible thing about this is Mr. Cook. He was the first person who stopped the help. After driving him briefly, 82 year old Donald Leroy Cook realized something was not right and pulled over. That is when police say Searcy assaulted Cook, causing injuries he would later die from. And today, Searcy got his chance to apologize for that day. I affected a lot of lives that one day, and not just mine, and I'm sorry for it. After his apology, the judge gave Searcy 10 years on the second degree manslaughter charge and 15 years for the first degree robbery charge. And Searcy's attorney tells me that he will be eligible for parole after serving about 13 years. In Lexington, Hillary Thornton, WKYT. Now, initially, Searcy was facing the death penalty when charged with murder, but the jury convicted him of manslaughter instead at his trial last month. In our county by county coverage at five, we're tracking stories in Barron and Woodford counties. In Barron County, the man suspected in the disappearance of a two year old girl went in front of a judge today. Anthony Barber pled not guilty to a kidnapping charge after police say he forced a woman to drive him around earlier this week. Barber is also a suspect in the death of two year old Laney Wallace in Monroe County. Her body was found Tuesday morning in a well more than a week after she went missing. Barber has not been charged in that case as of yet. UK's new feed mill on its Woodford County farm is now open. A fire destroyed the old one two years ago. The feed mill contains three tons of mixers. The mixers are designed for special research diets for the farm's sheep, swine, and cattle. Students and teachers now will be able to monitor the nutritional impact and growth and development within the farm's livestock. The students benefit, first of all, in uh, seeing the most modern. Uh, feed mixing operation basically in the country. Plus, they, it also serves research programs in which they're involved. That new facility cost about $3 million. A man is in the hospital after he was hit by a van on Eastland Parkway in Lexington. It happened just after 3 this afternoon near Dixie Magnet Elementary School. Lexington police say the man who was hit was driving a scooter. It appeared he pulled into the lane of oncoming traffic. Police say he was taken to a hospital with non life threatening injuries. No charges have been filed at this time. There are more cases of shigellosis in Lexington. The health department now says they're treating 45 cases of the stomach illness. That's three more than when they issued a health alert last week. 
The illness is most often seen in children. It is a highly contagious form of diarrhea. To prevent shigellosis, health experts say wash your hands with soap often. Cuba has been officially removed from America's list of countries that sponsor terrorism. Today's move is a major step towards normalizing diplomatic relations between the two countries. Cuba was originally placed on the terror list in 1982 when the U.S. government accused the Fidel Castro regime of sponsoring communist groups in Latin America and Africa. A new chapter began today in the rebuilding of Lower Manhattan. One World Trade Center opened its observatory to the public, marking a turning point in the recovery from 9-11. The observatory makes little reference to the attack on the Twin Towers, but right next door are the memorial pools honoring those who were lost. Four million people a year are expected to visit the observatory. We really felt for the American people, and we... we we just want to all be united and know that we're behind you, and this is the, the future. One World Trade is the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Pretty impressive. Yeah. Tonight, hundreds in Scott County will spend their night walking in the annual Relay for Life to raise money for cancer research and care. One woman with a team is a breast cancer survivor who never dreamed she would battle the disease. Her mission now is to give others hope and her inspiration is this month's Talk Pink. In life's quiet moments, Stephanie Welch is able to reflect on the last year and the journey she's been on that sort of came out of nowhere. I'd been having some pain on and off, but they had told me in the past that it was just caffeine or stress. Welch listened to that pain in her breast and went for a regular checkup. A mammogram and further testing revealed the 39-year-old had breast cancer. I wasn't even 40, so I shouldn't have even had my first mammogram. Um, and I keep thinking back now, what if I would have waited till I turned 40? You know, I was um, stage 3C. It was in um, 11 out of 12 lymph nodes. The busy wife and mother took the diagnosis head on. She had a double mastectomy and underwent treatment. Welch says she found strength in family and friends. That support of others led Welch to want to give back. Her journey led her to Scott County's Relay for Life. I had never been to a Relay for Life. I had never even attended one. Um, so I decided to have a team last year. Welch's warriors came out in full force. It was Stephanie's way of supporting others fighting just like her. In that survivor lap, you know, getting that medal on your neck, and I wasn't even finished at that point, but still, um, it was just, it was a wow moment. You know, it was. It was emotional, but it was like, I'm going to beat this. This year, Stephanie's team will be back. She joined the relay committee and has been hard at work planning for the night. Finished with treatments, this year will have extra special meaning, and she wants others to know there's hope. You know, stay strong. Um, there is a lot at the end of the tunnel. Well, Relay for Life in Scott County begins tonight at 6 at Evans Orchard and it will end at midnight. I'm going to be there helping to MC, so come out and see myself and visit Stephanie and her team. And to send in your breast cancer story, just go to WKYT.com and look for our Talk Pink section. It is time now for better living, health, education, and consumer news that impacts your life. The Department of Homeland Security is making a new push to find immigration violators at airports. Customs and border agents are conducting a three-month test of facial recognition technology to identify people who try to use someone else's passport. CBS's Chris Van Cleve reports. This bright light greeting some of the 19,000 plus international travelers who pass through customs every day at Dulles Airport outside Washington, D.C. could be the future of airport security. It's part of new facial recognition technology being tested by U.S. customs officers aiming to catch passport imposters. Customs and Border Protection Deputy Assistant Commissioner John Wagner. We do see people trying to use a legitimate document, but it belonging to someone else to conceal their identity, and we are vulnerable to that. Next, please. We were given rare access to this demonstration of the technology, comparing the photo in a passport with the person presenting it. The computer compares the two and rates how likely they are to be a match. 
The three-month pilot project at Dulles is part of a larger test of biometric technology. This fall, customs will begin collecting face and iris scans of people entering and returning from Mexico on foot at a San Diego area border crossing. But privacy rights advocates are concerned these test projects are just the beginning of law enforcement using biometrics to track law-abiding citizens. The real concern is not so much this particular pilot program, it is that this particular pilot program is a step towards a larger program. Customs officials say travelers are already required to present photo ID when entering the country. This technology simply confirms that. Chris Van Cleve, CBS News, Dulles Airport, Virginia. Well, the images taken during this program are being saved in a secure database that is not shared. Officials say when the pilot project is complete, those images will be deleted. And after the trial run, Customs will analyze the program's effectiveness to see if it should be expanded. The average price of popular generic drugs dropped about 4% in 2013. That is according to a report from the AARP Public Policy Institute, which looked at 280 generic drugs. Findings also show prices jumped on some generics by as much as 1,000%. If you are not making enough money, maybe it has something to do with your attitude. A new study shows cynical beliefs about others may be associated with a lower income. Researchers in Germany suggest cynical people may pass on chances to cooperate, which could further their careers. And finally, Lamborghini is getting family friendly for you. The sports car maker will roll out its first SUV in 2018. It's called the Urus. Lamborghini says the goal is to attract high end customers who like their style and design but find the sports car too restrictive. 